A live Kansas City scout cam look at Liberty right now. This is I-35 at 291 Highway near one of the wastewater testing sites where they test for the COVID virus. New numbers show this morning the viral load in the wastewater is either holding steady or dropping, but that wasn't the case earlier in the month. One place in the metro, we are seeing a 40% increase. So what does that all mean? We'll talk more about it coming up now on the Morning Medical Update. Good morning, everyone. It is finally Friday. It's April 15th. Thank you so much for joining us here on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Last minute to get your taxes done. Today is normally the due date, but the government has extended the deadline to Monday. Coming up, the BA2 variant now showing up in one metro county. At 8.15, Dr. Hawkinson joins us with the COVID count and another COVID surge in the metro. What testing the wastewater is telling us right now. So get your questions sent in to us on YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network. You can find links right there on your screen. First this morning in Johnson County, clusters of the COVID BA2 variant cases are being reported at daycares, schools, and in the workplace. The Johnson County Health Department reports 64 cases of BA2 per 1,000 people with a positivity rate of 6%. They believe that number is higher, but the results are not being reported due to people doing at-home testing. And the FDA has granted emergency use for this. It's the first COVID-19 breathalyzer. It's about the size of a piece of carry-on luggage, and you can get results in less than three minutes. The company says it was 90% effective in determining positive cases. The FDA still, of course, rep recommends getting a PCR test to confirm those results. Joining me this morning, our numbers gal is back, Dr. Amber Schmitke, Chair of the Division of Natural Sciences and Mathematics at the University of St. Mary. Also, Jeff Wenzel, the with the Bureau of Environmental Ep Epidemiology. I can't speak today on this Friday. He's with the Missouri Health Department. And Dr. Mark Johnson, so glad to have you with us. He leads the wastewater and COVID research for the University of Missouri. So glad to have all of you with us today. Gentlemen, good morning. All right, Dr. Schmicki, let's start with you. So it's been a while since we've looked at those national trends. So I just want to help help us kind of walk through what you're seeing and what you've been studying. So cases remain really low for most of the country, but in the Northeast, we're starting to see a pretty dramatic increase in cases and test positivity, et cetera. And they're starting to see an uptick in hospital admissions as well. Um, as we know, COVID often doesn't stay in one place. So of course we need to be vigilant during this time. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're just, it's a murky time for data. Uh, we have a situation where, as you pointed out, a lot of folks are not getting tested in a way that we can see. They're preferring those home-based tests that don't get reported to the state or to the federal government. And so um, we also have a challenge where, um, you know, the government is no longer paying for free testing for the poor and uninsured. And so it's possible that we aren't seeing a complete picture right now. So that does complicate So things. lots of new factors come into play yeah. right now. So let's talk about the numbers, though, when we talk about places like the Northeast, what we've seen in the past with the other variants what what that told you then and what it's going to tell us now about this variant um so what we've seen with every uh case search that's ever happened is that we see a rise in both ca uh, case rate as well as test positivity and test positivity is rising for the entire country right now every region in the country um, but we are only really seeing a case rise in the northeast um so it you know there's sort of this weird uh mix of the data right now um so we're we're in a place where we don't totally know what's going on and that's why we often have to look at proxy data, things like wastewater surveillance testing, which is why it's really exciting to see the other guests who are here today. Right. You say we don't always know what's going on. It's like, welcome to the pandemic, right? It's just <laughs> it's month to month, year to year at this point. OK, so let's talk about hospitalizations. Uh, walk us through that graphic as well. Yeah. So um, the graph that I brought with you today or with me today, excuse me, comes from the Department of Health and Human Services community profile report, and it breaks it down by region of the country. And so, like I said, we're currently seeing flat COVID admissions in the hospitals. Um, the one place where we are seeing as an increase right now is the Northeast, uh, which makes sense considering where the cases are at the moment. Um, so we'll just have to kind of see, uh, hopefully this doesn't come to the Midwest, uh, but I was telling you before we started the show, I've learned never to put COVID-19 in a box. Um, we've been surprised uh, multiple times about what it can do. And so I think it's important for all of us uh, to be careful. 
we like predictability, but not always going to be the case with this pandemic. That's for sure. Let's bring in uh, Jeff Wenzel and Dr. Mark Johnson just to talk about the wastewater sampling work that's going on. Uh, what, what kind of data um, are you seeing? What are we gathering and what is it telling us? Jeff, why don't you get us started? So for the last two years, we've been collecting wastewater samples, uh, looking for trends, uh, increasing, decreasing trends. Those 100 locations represent about 50% of the population of Missouri. Uh, over the last year, since February of last year, we've also been looking for the variants and unusual mutations in um, cases. So talk about the process of collecting the samples. How, how is that done? Usually it's a wastewater operator from a local uh, facility that's collecting that. It's a 24 hour sample. So they're taking um, incremental samples over the 24 hour period uh, until they get about a liter of water. And then that's shipped off to the University of Missouri Columbia where Dr. Johnson's lab analyzes it. All right, so there's a process. Dr. Johnson, jump in and tell us how helpful this collecting has been. Yeah, sorry, I was a little distracted. They don't usually collect it with their hands. There's usually machines that do it, but uh, it's it's been, especially with the variant lineage detection, it has been really uh, phenomenal in giving us a heads up on really not what's coming, but what's here already because t patient data is always several weeks behind. Um, one thing I can point out, um, we do all the sequencing in Missouri as well as for all of the sewer sheds from New York City. So. One difference I can point out between the Northeast and here is there is a new sub lineage of BA2 that is becoming very prevalent in the Northeast, which is BA2 12.1. Um, it's 15% of patient sequences right now in New York, but it's, you know, if it's 15% now, that means it's probably actually considerably higher because it's been steadily going up for the last three weeks. BA2 has been the dominant lineage in Missouri for weeks already. It's almost the only thing we're seeing. And there's been, so far at least, there's been no correlation between the prevalence of BA2 and the case numbers. The, even though BA2 is taking over, the cases have been going down. Dr. Schmicke, how does this information help, help you determine your numbers and your data? Well, you know, like I was saying, the, the data are kind of murky right now. And so we do look at proxy data like this. And so the wastewater surveillance can give a helpful heads up. One challenge is, you know, we're more than two years into the pandemic and we really don't have a robust network of uh, sampling sites across the country. Um, there are states with no sampling uh, that's happening. And for, um, you know, Missouri, they're actually kind of a leader in this way because uh, they have a very robust network of sites uh, that they're able to test. Like like they said, they're getting a good cross section of the population um, to see what may be coming. And so they can, it can kind of be the canary in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. What's nice about this is that you can see around some of these challenges that we have with testing um, because, uh, you know, this wastewater is looking at what's being shed in people's fecal material. And so it's not something that's uh, going to fluctuate based on people seeking or avoiding testing. Um, it's not something that, you know, is an issue of data reporting uh, and the delays in reporting that we're seeing. So it's, it's a, it can be a very helpful tool. All right, we're gonna to get to some community questions in just a moment. I wanna to turn to Dr. Hawkinson with our COVID count uh, before we get to that. Good morning, how are you today? Good. Good. Yeah, we have, uh, we've, you know, most of this week we've had single digits. Right now we have five active infections. Still that one person in the ICU and uh, is on the ventilator. Again, usually for severely ill people in the ICU, uh, we consider them in that active stage for about 20 days. So that could have an effect there. So five active infections. 28 additional uh, in that recovery period, a total of 33. But overall, um, we are happy to see that our active infections are going down. And now that we're talking about cases, um, some areas cases are going up, some areas cases are still continuing to fall. We understand that not everybody is getting tested at those sites that report to the government. Some people may not even be testing. Some people may be doing home testing. We also have the concern that maybe it's hospitalizations going up. But I think the other thing that we have to remember here is it's not black and white. So we know that in the last stages, while we were testing everybody who came into the hospital, we would find some people who were asymptomatic. And during those last couple weeks, we had about a third to about 50% of our active infections that we considered, but they were totally asymptomatic. We found them on screening. So just the fact that hospitalizations are going up, we also have to understand that may be a misnomer as well. And so moving forward, I think through all of this, when we have 
population immunity with so many people being vaccinated and or infected, individual immunity if you are vaccinated and up to date. Um, that is going to help uh, make it more difficult as well to see exactly how many people are coming into the hospital exactly for COVID. Um, are there still hospitals that are testing everybody that comes into the hospital uh, by screening PCR, even if they came in with say a broken leg, but they get screened and they're positive. So I think moving forward, um, it is going to be very difficult to tell what kind of um, uh, capacity issues we're having really what kind of the impact of surge uh, on cases and hospitalizations are, but hopefully we'll get some better information and data um, and then present that to you. Couple of questions from headlines this morning. The BA2 cases on the rise in Johnson County. What kind of, I live in Johnson County. What, what kind of concerns are those when we see those increases? I mean, I think we always have concern when we see increases, you know, um, increasing cases. We know that with increasing cases, there is that potential for increase in hospitalizations, but typically hospitalizations for COVID itself, uh, you know, lag behind at least a week, 10 days, 12 days prior to case, uh, pr after the cases start to surge. So it is obviously a concern. We know um, that there are no restrictions going on. We know that there are gatherings going on. And so there can be any time when you have lack of restrictions, no masking, people getting together. We saw this in Washington, D.C. We know there is the potential for that virus to spread to all of those people there in those spreading events. So it's a concern. I think everybody needs to continue to take um, in that risk assessment, judge their health, judge their risk, be up to date with vaccination to protect you individually. Uh, but yeah, it's always a concern because we know the virus is circulating um, within our community. All right, Pfizer says its booster shot strengthens the immune response for kids five to yeah. 11. What does that tell us about the timeline for kids under five getting the shot? Um, well, uh, so that's a different issue. So five to 11, we know that they are saying now it can improve your immune function. Um, we know that also with just vaccination, uh, it's those two doses that people got, but. Um, instead, is it that spread apart that may be better? So we know that that booster is coming four to six months after. I think that is a good sign for those children five to 11. As far as what does it mean for children five and under? Um, Peter Marks with the FDA was on a podcast recently and talked that they are continuing to analyze the data. And in his words, he hopes that there would be an approval before he goes on his next vacation. I don't know when that will be sometime in the summer, but I think we are all hoping for approval for vaccination for children five and under fairly soon, maybe within the next few months. Again, they're still analyzing and collecting all that data. All right, what are your thoughts on this breathalyzer? How does that work? I don't yeah, know. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think it's interesting. Anything we can do to help with diagnostics and early identification, because what is the key with early identification? It's getting treatment early, whether it's Paxlovid, Molnupiravir, Remdesivir, the monoclonal antibody. So I think that's important. But there are caveats with that breathalyzer test. They do state that even if it's positive, because they are looking for chemicals that your body is going to be excreting. Um, but they say if it's positive, that you should still follow up with a PCR test. But also, just like the antigen test, they say that you need to understand a negative result in the context of your own exposure history. Have you been around people? Were you at a, a large gathering? And so take that into consideration as well. At that point, you may also need to continue to get a PCR test as a, uh, a, a negative uh, proof that you don't have it. So there are caveats with this test, but um, it's one more thing that we can help use to identify early and hopefully get treatment early. Similar like the home test, you have to have that PCR. I think there's, so. There's it's, no, es there's no yeah. escaping the brain poke, right? They still believe that the PCR continues to be mm -hmm. the gold standard. You're exactly right, yep. All right, we've been talking about the Northeast. Let's take a, a live look at New York. Are we going to Times Square this morning? Can we head out there? All right, live look there in Times Square this morning. Uh, we've been hearing that Broadway, several performances have been canceled last week after Matthew Broderick contracted mm. the new variant mm. and others are playing with understudies and major roles uh, kind of as a safety precaution. Just another sign COVID is still here and it is still interrupting life as we know it. Dr. Amber Schmicke, um, with the early numbers that, that we're seeing, will this impact um, employers here in the Metro like this, where we, we see it interrupting life? We know COVID's there, but I think people have kind of turned the other cheek when it comes mm -hmm. to it. As 
as we well know. Um, but do you think we could see that? Uh, you know, anything's possible with this virus. And mm -hmm. we have seen that a lot of people have kind of started to move on and get some of that normal life back. And I know that that has been wonderful in many ways. Uh, that the thing about the virus is it's not quite out of our lives yet. And so we have some decisions to make about how much we try to control the virus as compared to letting it control us. Um, the reality is that if you have a lot of people out sick, you're, you're business may be closing temporarily just because you don't have enough staff. Um, and so the question is, how do we control that chaos to the extent that we can? Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see something like that again in the future. I don't think by any means that the pandemic is over. We know that we tend to see seasons with this virus. And so, um, you know, we may, we may still have some challenges. But the good news is we're heading into a time of year where it's warm enough outside yeah. that people may be more likely to gather outdoors. And that will always help. Or they may be more likely to open windows, et cetera. Your thoughts on the breathalyzer, just another another tool out there to help people get tested and, and possibly. Yeah, I, like Dr. Hawkinson said, I think it's really important to have as many testing entry points as we possibly can because um, with a lot of those treatments, it's really important that you start that treatment right away um, and in order to get the most benefit. And when we have the challenges that we do right now with testing centers closing or people unable that are uninsured having more difficulty accessing a test, making those tests readily available and fast is going to be really important. A couple questions we've got, um, and I'm gonna bring in Jeff and Dr. Johnson as well. Um, Isaac has a question, and it may have been answered earlier, but um, he wants to ask this again. If the, if the virus isn't thought to spread through the water, then how is wastewater a reliable means of detection? Any thoughts well, on it, that? It's, it's still a valuable indicator. It just so happens that once the virus spreads through the wastewater, it, it becomes inactivated. We, it, it is no longer infectious, but it is a very meaningful and accurate reflection of what's going on with cases in the community. All right, thank you for clarifying that. Question about um, well, the, what, else, what else can be detected through the wastewater? What other things are other you looking viruses, for? <laughs> just about anything. Other viruses, small molecules, we can, you know, you can detect opioids, drugs, um, you name it. Uh, we often, we, we you know, never guess. So we, we, we often need an indicator of whether the sewer, sewage has been uh, diluted or not. Guess what our best indicator is from a population, a small molecule that I bet you've consumed today? What's that? Caffeine. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm measure, that you can measure around. the caffeine and get a pretty good. So if the caffeine levels are down, you know, probably there was a lot of rain that got into your wastewater and it's been diluted. It's one of the more accurate um, indicators we found. How interesting. That is super interesting. That's super interesting. <laughs> okay, a uh, question from Pamela. Does the vaccine and booster work with the new variants? I heard they are ineffective with the new strains. Dr. Hawkinson, any insight on that? Yeah, I don't think that's true at all. So um, they are variants. Uh, certainly there is no other strain of SARS-CoV-2, so we should clarify that. But right now what we have seen through clinical and laboratory data is that the original uh, mRNA vaccines and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, the vaccines that we currently have, when you are up to date with your vaccines, they do produce immune responses to all of the variants that we've identified. So they do produce um, antibodies. They also continue to protect, probably mostly through T cell immunity. They continue to protect you from hospitalization, severe disease and death. All right, Kathy says she plans to get her fourth shot next week, 66 yeah. years old yeah. with autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. I wanna participate in a, uh, a, an event, mm -hmm. uh, a choir event, and then another one in the summer yeah. are the odds in my favor once she gets that shot, considering her age. You know how people just want you to tell yeah. them how to live their life. I know. It, <laughs> they want to hear it from you that it's okay. You know, she obviously has insight and, and has assessed her risk mm -hmm. and understands what her um, comorbidities may be. Obviously, age is a big one. Autoimmune disease, that is important. What we have also found is that, you know, for probably about 90 days after your, your dose, uh, you do even have fairly good protection against infection itself. And so I think that is important to note that in protection against infection does wane, but you do still have considerable uh, protection against hospitalization, severe disease and death, at least for uh, six months and, and probably more 
um, you know, again, given your age and your comor comorbidities that you have talked about. So you should be fairly safe. Uh, but again, anytime you, you do get that infection, you just have to be aware. That why, that's why it would be important, as we talked about with this breath test. If you do think you have been in a high-risk exposure situation, you do develop symptoms, please go get tested early. Talk with your, your doctors, and if you need to get on either remdesivir or monoclonal antibody or Paxlovid or molnupiravir, it's a good idea to get started as early as possible. Well, and it sounds like people really are taking the advice you've said all mm -hmm. along. They're, they're yeah. starting to list out yeah. all of the things that may be a factor yeah. and then make that decision. Yeah. Good, good advice. All right, uh, let me see, I've got another question. Well, let me ask, I wanna ask our, our guests, Jeff and Dr. Johnson, kind of walk us through, uh, Jeff, just kind of how your, how COVID has impacted the work that you do over the last two years. Kind of take us through a, kind of a quick timeline uh, when this pandemic hit, uh, the work you've been doing and the work you still continue to do. Well, sewer shed monitoring uh, had never been done in Missouri and really most of the United States. So starting yeah, around this time, two years ago, we, we ramped up sewer shed testing to see if it would be beneficial in telling us something about this uh, outbreak and disease. And uh, we've been growing and expanding ever since. Dr. Johnson, COVID impact on yeah. your work. Uh, it has changed it entirely. I used to study HIV. Now all I do is study poop. <laughs> it's it's, it's, been, a, it's been a giant change. Well, I'm sorry to ask you this, but could you go, could you give us further details about that? Uh, we appreciate um, your shift in what you study, um, but explain that a little bit more for people. You mean the process of, of doing the analysis? Yeah. Well, it, it's not as bad as it seems. It comes in little tubes about yay big, about a quarter cup is what it takes for us to do the analysis. And it's it's not as bad as you think. Uh, we, we first filter it to get rid of all of the solids and then we extract the RNA from that. and. The RNA is the material that's inside the virus that contains the information about which variant it is. And that's what you use for both quantifying how much virus is present and also for sequencing to figure out which of the variants it is in that community. Tell us a little bit of the work you do with HIV. Oh, um, gee, I have to think back. Um, <laughs> no, I, I mostly studied... Uh, how the virus and the host interacted and towards the end were, was had some drug development uh, process that I was working on to see if we could help uh, clear virus from the, from the cell or from the body. Um, seems like that's forever ago that that was one, that was a whole pandemic ago. Right. I know. Well, we talk about, it. I mean, Dr. Hawkinson works with HIV patients and um, we've got uh, World's AIDS Day coming up next week, I believe. So it's always a topic that we're always interested in. So um, thank you for your work with that as well. Joellen has a question. What about safety returning to the gym? Dr. Hawkinson, help us. I need to get back into exercise, something you tell people mm -hmm. don't skip out on exercise. That keeps us health healthy. Yeah. But she's over 70, but she yeah. has had her fourth uh, her fourth shot and she does wear a mask yeah. so equate that for us yeah you know i think i think that can be fairly safe if you can also find times when the gym may not be as busy that's good as well i think um, it is difficult to do some exercises with a mask like running on a treadmill so you have to take that into account but i, I think you should be able to go ahead and do that and of course now it, it should be fairly nice where you can also walk outside but i think going to gym uh, assessing all of those risks um, I think you're, you're as safe as you possibly can be. Again, you can lower that risk by also going at, at less busy times. I would probably avoid those classes where people are getting together in those rooms and, and breathing pretty profusely, um, expelling droplets and, and virus into the, into the air should they be infected. So, but I think you can go and, and do weights and work or work out with a trainer. I think you can do that safely, especially with a mask. Yeah. Doc Hawk, Isaac has a, just a your thoughts on this, but in the future, you know how we have breathalyzers for booze. What do you mm -hmm. think about bouncers using the uh, the COVID breathalyzer at the door to find out if you're infected? <laughs> yeah, I, I think if the sensitivity and specificity mm -hmm. is there, I think that's reasonable. Uh, but we also have to understand, I don't know how long those volatile compounds would be uh, abnormal or detected. Uh, because we know that people can detect, you can detect PCR positivity even up to 90 days after having the infection. So does that mean you can't go into a bar for 90 days? Depending on how long those chemicals that that breathalyzer detects 
are still able to be detected? Is it just when you're in that active viral replication or does that continue? So I think um, that would be an interesting thing rather than some vaccine passports or vaccine cards. That's one more thing that, that you could use. Um, it's a good thought, but uh, you know, we just have to wait and see uh, if all of those questions that I asked about that, certainly that would cause, and, and if it were uh, helpful, you know, maybe, maybe a reasonable thing, but I don't foresee that in the future. Dr. Schmidt, keep uh, Kansas and Missouri kind of have moved into the endemic phase of the pandemic. Um, no masking, less testing. How do we combat that? Well, first, I want to say that endemic does not mean the end of the pandemic. And I think that that's a misnomer because yeah. of the root term. Uh, what that means is that there is a low level of disease that is below what's called the epidemic threshold. Uh, we should be aware that that um, you know, case rate can spike above that epidemic threshold at any time. Um, and so that's why it's important to continue to have good data collection so that we know what's coming and so that we can adjust our protection uh, strategies as needed. So can we show this graph that kind of intertwines that kind of where it meets with the, the disease, public health and human behavior? Because I guess we talk about breathalyzers at bar, the doors of bars. We talk mm -hmm. about, you know, what people are just going to get back to doing. So how does this all intersect? So, yeah, public health. I love the public health because what it really is, is an intersection between things like infectious disease in this case and social behavior. Um, so we really are, you know, it's, it's important about messaging and what are people doing? And so the graph that we're showing here is um, sort of a timeline so that you can sense like from the per the day that a person is exposed about how many t days does it take for them to start developing symptoms and maybe they seek a test right away maybe they don't um, on average it takes about another four to f it could take up to four to five days after the onset of symptoms for a person to seek a test so that helps us to understand why we've been sort of um, always a little bit behind the trend with the data that we have um, which again is another reason why um, the surveillance testing that um, the other guests on the panel today, the, the, the work that they're doing can be really, really important um, because it helps us to see around the fog of that delay due to social behaviors, um, test seeking behaviors, that sort of stuff. So you had mentioned there's multiple layers to making the spread slow, possibly stop. Can you demonstrate that through one of your graphs? Do you have one of those? Yeah, I brought a, a I don't know if they have it, but the I Swiss so. cheese picture. Oh, yes. yes. We love our Swiss cheese Yeah. Model. I mean, this is an oldie but a goodie. We've been talking about this since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and it's just the idea that, um, you know, we don't have a single bulletproof strategy against COVID-19. And so that's why it's important to, and in that sense with this graphic, because none of them are bulletproof, you can think of them like a slice of Swiss cheese with the holes in them. And if you were to breathe through a, a slice of Swiss cheese, obviously some air is going to get from one side to the other because of those holes. Um, but the more of those strategies that we layer together, the more stacks or, or slices of Swiss cheese that we stack together, the more likely we are to um, cover enough of those holes um, that we do get that protection. And so it's a, it's a mix of shared responsibilities between individuals and communities. Dr. Schmecki, now that is one of your graphs I can I can totally read and understand. <laughs> okay, so you're our numbers person, uh, but you break it down with Swiss cheese. I'm I'm totally on board. I get it. Okay, quick question. Well, do we have any reporters on the line? No reporters. Okay, I'm going to get uh, Dr. Hawkinson to Maggie's question. I've had the shot for immune compromised. I've had the shot for immune compromised. Do I get a booster after six months? I'm 81. Mm -hmm. Thank you for all you do, by the way. Yeah. So just she's had the shot 81 yeah. immune compromised. Does she need another one? Yeah. I mean, if, if you're telling me immune compromised, that does put my mind and in, in, in you into a different category. So certainly we, we know that there is that recommendation for that fifth dose. If you're immune compromised, remember, if you do have immune compromised, which is a broad uh, spectrum and you need to speak with your your physician about that uh, but it's pretty broad so it's basically three primary doses and then it's that first booster and then it's that second booster which would be a total of five so if you've received four and it's been over six months I think it would be a good idea I'm certainly a proponent especially because of your age alone uh, that you would go ahead and get that um, that additional booster. So that would be a fifth dose, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. Last question is from Joyce, and it's for Dr. Schmidke. Do you think there is sufficient information now to accurately track COVID infections? 
Wow. Um, well, we know that we've been undercounting COVID cases for a very long time. So it's it's um, it's one of those things that I think that public health is doing the very best that they can um, with the data streams that they have. Um, in the end, there's a lot of diseases where we undercount disease, um, diarrheal illnesses being a big one, um, because a lot of people will shrug that off and, and take care of it at home. It's self-limiting and they never do seek treatment. And so those are cases that go unreported every year. Um, and so with the, the same sort of thing is going to exist here. I can understand and appreciate what I think may be some frustration um, that may be coming in with that question, the sense that, well, what is going on? And it does feel like nobody seems to know, right? But the we do try to make the best estimate of the situation with the data that we have. And right now, um, what it tells us is that at least in the metro for now, things to seem to be okay. Um, but we are seeing some warning signs in other parts of the country. So glad you got to come on today alongside with Dr. Johnson and Jeff today. So it really helped kind of put the big picture of what you do into perspective. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. Jeff, I want to start with you and just get your final thoughts. Just uh, anything that I haven't asked you that you want everyone to know about. Statewide, looking at um, all of our locations, we're at the lowest viral load total um, that we've been in since we've been monitoring. Dr. Johnson, your final thoughts for us today. Oop, I'm mute. Sorry. Uh, there you go. <laughs> sorry, things are, th like Jeff said, things are looking good. If they start changing, you'll hear from us. Okay, we're gonna get you back on. Thank you so much. We appreciate all your information and all that you do for us. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Schmitke, again, great to see you. Final thoughts for us today. Yeah, I was just going to share the story. I um, got to meet a co-worker's brand new baby about a week ago, um, and I think it's important to um, remember that, like Dr. Hawkinson was saying, we have a lot of tools on the treatment side, but we have a lot of tools on the prevention side, too. When I went to see that baby, I made sure to do one of those rapid antigen tests at home prior to even getting in the car, because the very last thing I want to do is give COVID-19 to a newborn. Um, so so anyway, I just wanted to share that. We, we still have some really easy things that we can do to keep each other safe. Such a great reminder, because it's about, again, thinking of other people, thinking mm -hmm. of you. But if you don't think of you, at least think of other people yeah. and their newborn babies. Dr. Hawkinson, final thoughts from you today. Yeah, I'll, I'll certainly echo uh, Dr. Schmidtke's comments. And just, you know, hopefully it'll be a, a, a nice uh, Easter weekend and people can get out and be active. Um, if you want to go to the gym, go to the gym. Again, assess your risk and protect yourself as much as possible, but continue to be active and, and keep moving and be healthy. All right, we're talking Mother's Day. Dr. Schmitke, what do you guys do for Mother's Day? It's coming up in about a month. What do you get? Do you get well, pampered, spoiled from the kiddos? <laughs> I'd like to think so. Um, but at University of St. Mary, that is our graduation weekend. So I'll be oh. celebrating Mother's Day with all the other um, graduating seniors' mothers, too. And all those proud moms out there, for That's sure. That's right. All right, so we want to know kind of what, what you want and what you plan on doing for Mother's Day. There's a QR code right there on your screen, and you can email us at the Medical News Network there on your screen as well. Just let us know your ideas. Let us know what you want. And we found out what some moms want by hitting the streets here inside the health system. Here's what they had to say. Definitely a card and take her out to dinner. Fruit, lotions, and perfume. Usually for Mother's Day, I just like to hang out with my son. Just have a, a day where we usually go out to the park or something, and we just have like a day we spend together. It's really not a big thing. I don't really do gifts for Mother's Day. It's just quality time. I would love a coach purse, yes, for Mother's Day. I would really love that. So for Mother's Day, I celebrate my great-grandma because she is the, one, is the one who raised me my entire life. So I get her flowers every year, some roses and some daisies. So she likes flowers, and that's what I like to get her. Oh, that's a good boy right there. That's a good boy. And look at that mom just straight up asking for the coach purse. You like the woman who knows it. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> exactly. All right. I like bacon and peace and quiet. So hopefully that's that's on the menu for me this, this Mother's Day. Thank you all so much for being with us. Don't forget you can catch our shows anytime on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. And as we leave you today, we want to share some good news with you. We are so proud to announce that the Royals have, again, chosen the University of Kansas Health System to be their official health care provider for the next four years. The University of Kansas Health System's president and CEO, Bob Page, and Royals president, Dayton Moore, discuss what makes this partnership unique. Have a great weekend. The Royals are proud to partner with the University of Kansas Health System for the 12th consecutive year. We have seen how they provide the best care for our athletes, 
but also all of Kansas City. Our partnership has helped us win championships in the past, and we're looking forward to winning more in the future. The University of Kansas Health System is consistently ranked among the best health systems in the country. We are committed to providing world-class care for the Royals organization and its family members. And we're equally committed to providing that same level of care to the Royals fans. We're excited about another great season of Royals baseball. Go Royals! Coming up Monday on the Morning Medical Update. No masks required, just as spring and summer travel arrive. We know COVID is still here, but what else poses a threat? Protecting yourself on planes, trains, and automobiles. That's Monday at 8 on these social media channels. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.